Let us drain our cups to these three strong bastards! When you look at the dragons, what do you see? When dragons flew to war, everything burned. I do not wish to rule over a kingdom of ash and bone. Aegon Targaryen sits the Iron Throne. Mm. The crown cannot stand strong if the house of the dragon remains divided. Men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne. The princess has a dragon, you dumb cunt. <laughs> well, have your tongue for that. If he can keep his tongue, dreams didn't make us kings, dragons did. The Ricaris. Welcome back. My name is Kit. I'm Andy. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things, streaming House of the Dragon. This is House of the Dragon, episode three. We don't know the title yet because the screeners don't have TBD. titles. TBD. And they don't announce the title until a couple days after the episode airs. We just found out episode two is called Rainier the Cruel. Yeah. And he's back. Hi, guys. He's returned here. from his, his journey. He spent a fortnight the down Dornish the King's beaches Road. on the beaches of <laughs> Flowrider. It was a good time, guys. I Hanging really out with time. Dornish girls. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andy missed the controversy. I want, I, want, I want to address this at the top of the show. If you're new here, welcome. What we're going to do is talk about our overall thoughts about episode three, go into a deep dive, a recap, full scene by scene, yapping about the episode, followed Just up yapping. with our Valyrian steels, our top three favorite moments of the episode, and then our dragon eggs, some Easter eggs, book lore, things that we can glean from the text, and then our mummer's dragon, our favorite performance of the episode. But we're gonna add what we do in our Game of Thrones coverage, that is only for patrons every Wednesday, and talk about our uh, a wet, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Westerospection. Uh, things for people who have read the book, or don't care. So that'll be a spoiler filled talk at yeah. the very end very of the episode. End. Don't we'll, worry about that. We'll warn you. We'll warn you. But at the top, I want to address. I'm actually surprised we didn't get more emails. I got a lot of action on like Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. I'm embarrassing myself. And it's not my fault. But I am going to be humble and say I was wrong. It was Eric and not Eric that had won that battle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Andy, you missed all of this controversy. And oh, I'm you guys curious were... how you interpreted it or if you you probably watched the uh, after the episode stuff like I did not. But um, so that was after the episode. One of the first things I was doing was like, which one won? Because like I was pretty sure that like Rhaenyra's Eric had won just because like he said your grace instead of you sure. bitch or something. <laughs> um, sure. I'm sorry, you bitch. <laughs> but I have read since then that like the showrunner confirmed that Eric with an E won that fight. Right. And so I was wrong. And in fact, Steve was right to a degree that he called everything. Right. So it was Erica and Steve and I were watching that episode together. And oh, Steve, God. Eric, Eric and Erica. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh God. We didn't put that together. <laughs> so we were uh, er Erica and I thought that uh, the intruder won the fight. Yeah. Eric and we, a. we convinced We'll just call him Arik from yeah. just to keep people from being more confused. And I convinced Steve that Arik won because of the staging, the blocking and the wounds that they sustained. Yeah. Now, the showrunners maintain Ryan Condal um, maintains that that was intentional. The confusion was neat. So we uh, intentionally had each of them sustain the same wounds so that you couldn't tell that way. I'm going to call bullshit on that because the one gets the leg cut. They both get cut legs. Oh, they do? But uh, one gets their right leg cut. The other Arik gets, their gets left. Uh, his left leg cut. And Eric gets his right leg cut. And it's the guy with the right leg cut that gets his fingers pushed into the wound and then crawls for the sword and then gets stabbed. So I will say I'm wrong. Don't say I'm being like a petty bitch or anything. I'm wrong. However, it was blocked poorly. I know that was intentionally confusing. But if they wanted to do that, they, they cut the wrong legs. Because I can tell. Wow. But all of the other cues, as Steve pointed out, uh, like the Your Grace, and even before that, the uh, You Separated Us, you know, like all of the dialogue cues point toward what they want you to see, which is that Eric won. Mm -hmm. um, and I recontextualized those cues based on my the, the blocking. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, I mean, you could take it that maybe he's had a change of heart, and that's why he's calling her Your Grace, like the grief of his brother's death. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I, I did too much in my brain because I was so set on that leg wound. And it made more sense to me that Arik would commit suicide 
than Eric, who had done nothing wrong. He had honored his vows. He had, you know what I mean? He was with the true queen. He had protected her. And I guess your people are like, well, he killed his brother, his soulmate. I'm like, I guess. But like the other one who realizes he had gone so far outside his own morality would be grief stricken by having killed his brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. Enough to commit suicide. That made more sense to me. I like that better, to be honest. But I, I concede I am wrong. I wish that the showrunner hadn't said who won. I do too. And yeah. I went on a huge rant in the Discord about how I hate the fact that after each episode, they do this thing where they they get a chance to explain what they meant yeah. by their own episode when that's not fair. You made your episode. We get to take it now. We get to say what it means. Yeah. Because there was this other thing, and this infuriates me, where Tom Glenn Carney came out and said that that scene where he passes Helena on the staircase is supposed to be shared grief the, and stuff. The yeah. shared grief and unspoken connection that these two Not at all. husband and wife and siblings have. I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> That's not what that scene means at that all. That was discomfort and avoidance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and now you have people in your comment sections when you're talking about this scene that you've spent a lot of effort like parsing and interpreting. Now it's subjective anyway, but what's annoying is they get the confidence of that's what the creators said it means. So mm -hmm. fuck you. And I'm like, they don't get to say what it means. <laughs> I do want to push back a little that I think the creators are able to, are, are allowed to come out and say like, hey, I was intending to do this with my work, but I do feel like you have to kind of wait to see what people's reactions are to it. Yeah, do it in the commentary. Say that. Yeah, do it in the commentary. But this whole like, oh, you just watched the show? Let me tell you exactly what I meant. It really does feel like they're trying to get ahead of discourse uh, and not allowing people to interpret. And because because once you make a thing and you put it out into the world, it does cease to belong to you. It belongs to the people and how it's ingested and the subjectiveness that people view through it. Um, yeah, but, Roland but, Barthes, but, but, but be, death of the author. But being able to like say it immediately, just kind of, I feel like it takes a, a little bit away from the discourse of what things mean and... I, again, like I don't want them to not be able to like say that. I just think they need to like step back and let the world sort of like interpret what they're seeing um, before they kind of weigh in. I don't know. Yeah, but also just to be clear, I was wrong. <laughs> 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 just wanted to start the show with that. So let's dive into episode three. We got a lot to talk about as quick as we can and a lot to parse through uh, before the showrunners come out and say that we're wrong. Andy, yes. I'm curious what your overall thoughts are on episode three. Um. I think that it had a little bit of a slow start. There was, um, well, actually I loved the very beginning and then there was a lot of like, let's all meet around the table and then now let's watch these people meet at their table and now let's go back to the other table and then back to the other table. There was a lot of that. And so it started to feel like a, uh, okay, can somebody do some of the things that you're talking about doing? Um, but it, got its legs, um, like maybe for me at least, uh, like a half hour or so into the episode. And it went out on such a phenomenal sequence and scene that I, I absolutely loved it by the end. And then everything else felt necessary. I also loved the uh, themes that they were establishing throughout the episode and coming back to them throughout. And uh, we'll talk about them as the episode goes on. I think that, um, why people do what they do is uh, a huge theme of it. And uh, the concept of grief and uh, one-upping one another uh, it, with trauma is another uh, prevalent theme in this episode. I, and I think that they crushed those uh, ideas. I also love the um, how the little people are affected moments. Um, and sometimes they outright talk about it. And, uh, you know, that's a theme through all of Game of Thrones, but uh, I love the way that they interpret it through this episode. But yeah, it was a great one. Steve, what about you? Uh, I agree with Andy. The The first half of this episode, I was a little bit worried, like mm, this, um, this feels like a transitional episode, like, which is, which isn't a bad thing per se, but I was kind of like, mm. but then by the end of it, I was like, all right, fucking love this. I love where that went. Uh, I do love this theme of violence, beginning violence and revenge, um, just beginning revenge and just how the cycle of violence is like, it gets to the point where people don't even realize why wars happen. And I love how they kind of show in the very, very beginning, the Brackens and Blackwoods, how they have this ancient Hatfield and McCoy, uh, uh, McCoy style feud that no one really truly knows what began, but they've been feuding for so long. And it's just violence, beginning violence, beginning violence. Ma uh, Capulet and Montague. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A classic, you know, just family feuds. Do you, you buy your time at me, sir? <laughs> I found you. We need Steve Harvey to come in here. 
and settle the Blackwoods and Brackens. So I love how they kind of shape the theme of this episode of, of you know, we don't want to go down this path because it's just going to be, you know, r- create more uh, war by kind of opening up with the family, the two families in the Westeros that have like th- the same theme going on with them. Uh, so I thought that was great. And then uh, the, the ending, the, the final scene, really, I didn't I, I didn't see that coming at all. And I quite loved it. And it was riveting. And I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. And it, it's just what House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones does best. It's it's two people, two actors just killing it with dialogue. And uh, yeah, so this is actually I, I like this episode a lot more than I thought I was going to based on like the first half of it. Uh, but Kit, what was your overall thoughts? I feel Similar to both of you, but I, I think Andy hit the nail on the head for how I felt. I even told you because I kind of I had watched most of this episode. You cheated prior to meeting. You cheated. And I told you I wasn't that fond of it, but I hadn't watched the entire thing. And now it might be my favorite of the three we've gotten so far this season. So it's like Andy said, like it kind of starts pretty slow and a little wearisome. And they made some decisions. I was kind of because there's something I told you off air that we'll talk in Western inspection. Yeah. That we both kind of like, oh, that I think is confirmed. And <laughs> we, I can't. we started laughing at that. I looked at you because you had told me this theory and I started laughing and poor Andy's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what. So I, know. I can't, I can't we'll wait talk for this about combo in Western inspection. Um, <laughs> Stay tuned. But Andy. I, I, I fucking loved that final sequence so much. And the appearance of a beloved actor from season one uh, mm. pulled at my heartstrings and, and uh, it made me so happy. So I can't wait to talk about that. But I, I'm eager to get into the meat of this episode, uh, give it to me and give it to me raw, as they would say in Rings of Power. Are you guys ready for that? Yes. All right, let's do it. So uh, at the beginning of the episode, we get some Brackens and Blackwoods, and we've seen these families before. Uh, I imagine we'll talk about it in, in Dragon Eggs, uh, but they all we know for sure is they are, they're in the Riverlands. They don't like each other. The Brackens have declared for uh, Aegon II, and the Blackwoods have declared for Rhaenyra. They're arguing over some boundary stones. The Brackens guy's name is Aaron and the Blackwoods is Ben. So there's a, a confrontation. Did they say his name was Ben in the show? I, was, I couldn't. I was trying to keep up with who they I, I saw that Aaron they, came up. They, he named himself as Aaron like that was in the captions. Yeah. No, they haven't confirmed that this is Ben Jacob Blackwood, but it kind of has to be. OK, because it's definitely not Lord Samwell. He's too young. Right. Um, it's not Willem Black. Uh, the, the fake character from yeah. the season one. The little yeah. badass. The little kid who killed the Blackwood in season one. He must have been like a third son or something then. But it's silly that they made him up because they didn't need to in retrospect. Right. Um, the guy in season one, the little kid that's right. She's got a dragon, you dumb you cunt. Dumb cunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but any whoozle, they argue a bit and the Bracken kid seems pretty scared, but he's like got to uphold his honor. Like he doesn't want to fight at all, but he's like, uh. Can't bitch out in front of my friends. You, you yeah. step to me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> should we have a dance off? That's what I love so much. But we uh, we should say that when we started watching um, episode one, we accidentally started yeah. this episode first <laughs> and got pretty far into the scene before finally we were like, we're watching the wrong thing. Yeah. And so I've been looking forward to this opening sequence. Or the, yeah, this opening You're scene. You're like, but that was awesome. From the beginning. <laughs> right, yeah. Just because I love the idea of the little people and how do they react when the people above them make decisions and now these people are being forced to fuck with each other even though they otherwise wouldn't. They would normally be fighting over where the sticks and stones are and this is my land and that's your land and instead now it's like, oh, now we're at war with each other. Yeah. And so our little squabbles are a lot bigger. And I, I loved the... Um, the fear in the Bracken kid's eyes, because like, that's how any one of us probably would be in that same situation where it's like, oh my God, am I about to like fight this guy? Am I gonna win? You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, it's so fucking scary, even in those tiny squabbles. And to see that humanistic aspect of it is really, really moving, even if you don't know who these people are. Yeah. Which we don't. Well, I mean, when, <laughs> when we accidentally started watching this instead of the first episode, I remember, looking to you guys like, man, what a bold choice to open the second season on the Brackens and Blackwoods. <laughs> you did. You literally Fucking said wild. that. Fucking <laughs> wild. And I was like, I, again, who had already watched it was like, uh, uh, I don't know what's going on. This isn't it, fam. I thought they I, re-edited it because I had seen the at the world premiere, but then Andy was the one that pulled it up. So I was like, 
it never occurred to me he clicked the wrong episode. I was just panicking, like, what is going on right now? And somehow it went to three instead of two. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Yeah, because you clicked one. It was weird. I don't understand. So I so the reason why I asked, like, if this is definitely supposed to be Ben, was I asked, the way this scene ends, sort of, is so he pushes Aaron, and then Aaron draws a sword and points at him, and then this uh, Blackwood kid's like, you wouldn't dare. And then it smash cuts to... Aaron Bracken being dead in a, in a battle, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought the implication was that he he, he did dare, yeah. and he killed that kid, which initiated the 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 battle. That's how I like thought that was the implication. But I know a lot of people online are uh, speculating that this Blackwood kid is Benjamin Blackwood, the lad. I mean, in the context of the show, it makes no sense to show him on screen because you got to think. You're, put yourself in the shoes of the average watcher. You're you know you're. Sunday night, you haven't watched TV in three days. You're turning on House of the Dragon. Who the fuck's that? Yeah. Right? Who and then, oh, okay, I guess they don't like each other. You know, I'll, the the showrunners after the episode will tell me what's the deal with them. <laughs> yeah. You guys probably know more about this than we do at this point. And then, <laughs> you know what I mean? When he comes back, if he does, as Benji Cop Blackwood for a brief role later on in episode eight or whatever, if it's another different guy, well, how does that benefit you? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To... It, it just seems weird because they're con- condensing other characters in in a way that we'll talk about in West Respection that's like huge um, in order to keep that confusion from happening. So I don't know. It just seems like they're really leaning. The way I read that scene was you wouldn't dare. And he did not dare. But things escalated in a couple of weeks, you know, because okay. obviously there's armies there. Yeah. Know, yeah in yeah. the aftermath. So that didn't happen right then. You know what I mean? No, there's, just an, arm, there's an army off screen. Yeah. I, like, I like to think right, that he disarmed him and killed him with his own sword. And that was the first death. And then they all went and got their homies and then the big battle. <laughs> <laughs> so he smashed cut to a dead body that's been there for like yeah. a couple right. days. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, so that's what happens. It smash cuts to the aftermath of what is known as the Battle of Burning Mill. How do we know that? It says... I mean, there's a burning mill in the background. Yeah. <laughs> that, and I think one of the characters in the, one of the council scenes is like, Later the Battle on. of Burning Mill was not a great success. But that's why they named it that, because mm-hmm. there's Burning Mill. Yeah. But in that battle, Lord Samwell Blackwood was slain. Uh, and then we get Alison Blackwood, sister of the Lord, uh, known as Black Alley, that does some cool shit. But we didn't get to see any of that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but hopefully that'll, that'll be seen later. But then we we cut after the battle to Eric and Eric being buried um, on Dragonstone. And and I like Rhaenyra. Is, is, she's cool because Jace is like, fuck that dude. Wait, is it that one? No, it's that one. Uh, <laughs> fuck one of these guys. And Rhaenyra is like, he was just honoring his oath. Mm-hmm. That's all. He, you know, he did what he was told. Uh, I have no fault. I don't fault him for that. Something like that. Right. And then Jace is like, but what about the men who instructed him to do this? Yeah, I think we should fly over and kill them. And Rhaenys says that Otto Hightower would never have allowed this. Um, and she, again, I think the themes that Steve were talking about come up here because that's why they start with the, the Brackens and the Blackwoods, these families that don't even remember why they're mm-hmm. so mad at each other. Because And then Rainey says, you know, we may never remember what started this war. And Rainier is like, well, it started because they took my throne. And Rainey's is like, did it? Yeah. Because it could have started when, you know, uh, when the baby when, got killed. When the baby was killed, or maybe when Luke died, or maybe when Eamon lost his eye. Like, mm-hmm. and Rainier, Rainier seems to be listening, and she's Rainier, Rainier says, uh, "There's nothing so cursed by the gods as a war between Ken, and nothing so bloody as a war between dragons." Yeah, I was gonna say crazy, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy fuck. It's wild as shit when <laughs> dragons fight. Um, but Rainier, saw, Rainier was, keeps it real, you know. Mm-hmm. Rainier again surprising. kind of mentions like there could be another way to avoid war. Alice in Hightower. Yeah, so, just planting that seed a little bit. He, there it worms are it worms their way into Rhaenyra's mind. We can see it by the end of the episode. And by the way, people have been emailing saying that you forgot to mention that Rhaenys is the hand of the king to or hand of the queen to Rhaenyra. She's not. Um, she's not. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Why, know any other way to say that. Yeah. Why are people saying this again? What's this? We got multiple emails and a few DMs saying you never mentioned that Rhaenys is. She I mean, has a she, pen that kind of looks like a hand. I think I don't even think there's a pen. On, I looked several times to see what they were seeing. I know that in book canon, she's never the hand. But I thought, hey, maybe they're doing some crazy stuff. She does give counsel directly to Rhaenyra a lot, but that's just yeah. She's got a, a family she's, member. She's she serving respects. as a hand in a hand role, kind of. She's handy. Yeah, she's very handy. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so then we cut to- I Chris. believe the role she's actually playing is that of a real one. <laughs> yeah. uh, we cut to Kristen Cole, who has performance anxiety. He seems pretty nervous about his first outing as hand. He's late for the council meeting because a pen cannot be penned to his armor because he's also Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. He has like a hand necklace with all the hands clasping. Mm -hmm. It's neat. I mean, I mean, we've all been there when somebody's like, hey, we're promoting you to this new position. It has you're not work, qualified for. But you're still doing your old job at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not getting paid more. No. no. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that. And we, we get the dropping of the green Targaryen banners. I like a lot of the imagery in the scene. Uh, he's late for the council meeting. He eyeballs his fellow King's guard like, hey, you're sitting on the stairs. These are new guys. He doesn't know who bro. these guys are. Yeah, so you guys are lazy. Yeah, who hired these new you're lazy supposed to ass either King's be guard? Standing at your post or fucking the queen. That's what I told you. Yeah. <laughs> Except that last part. Forget that last part. <laughs> That's only my job. And uh, everybody's kind of shitty to him at the council like, oh, hello. Glad you made it. Cole doing super important shit, I guess. Not. <laughs> Dork. Um, I like how he grabs his little clock in ball by like <laughs> getting awkwardly close to the queen because he's too comfortable with her. Excuse you know what me. I mean? Like you would never do that if if it was it, it would be rude to do that if it wasn't somebody you were sleeping with. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. and he like gave her a little kiss on the cheek. <laughs> <laughs> hey, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they all give him shit for sending uh, Arik to assassinate Rhaenyra. Um, and especially Alicent, and your scheme was rash. I told you, I, I the rash cleared up. No, your scheme was rash. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that one was. <laughs> and they talk about the Battle of Burning Mill and how Lord Samuel Blackwell was uh, Blackwood was slain. They also talk about Grover Tully. I fucking hate that Martin did that because that's not like him. You know, there's nothing else like that. Are you taking you taking away my dragon egg? No. We'll talk about it later, <laughs> but I hate that he did it. Wait, hate that who did what? You'll find out okay. in the dragon egg section. I'll just say it now because we're talking about it. So the the Tullys at this point are Easter eggs for Muppets. Mm -hmm. So there's Grover Tully, like from Sesame Street. His grandson is named Elmo Tully. His sons are named Kermit and Oscar Tully. <laughs> Swear so to God. They're, <laughs> all Easter eggs for Muppets. I for Sesame this. Street specifically. And you may be a hater, Kit. But honestly, it just makes me love Gurm even more. But like, they do important things. Oh, are you saying right. Elmo doesn't do important things? He <laughs> teaches our children how to read and count. Like Kermit Tully becomes a huge part of this. And it <laughs> hey pisses man, me hey off. Man, hey man, it ain't easy being green. <laughs> Everyone in this council knows that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> I just hope when we finally meet Elmo Tully, he's just like, Elmo said we have to go to the bottom of the trident. <laughs> This is Elmo's friend, Rock. <laughs> Rocky, sorry. <laughs> He's a fucking eunuch. And then everyone's like, uh, uh, Grover Tully, will you help us? Only if we're far <laughs> versus near. <laughs> okay. Got an Oscar you're, coming in? You're not getting, you're not getting my uh, Sesame Street? I actually watch more Sesame Street than either of you probably I, now. You probably do. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Elmo says. God damn it. Uh, they also discuss that Harrenhal is the key to the Riverlands. Again, we've seen this before. Aegon, and, and, which is why I was a little weary of this, right? Like Aegon really wants to do stuff and nobody else does, right? And he's slamming daggers and I want to go kill. Harrenhal is the key to the Riverlands. Again, we've been talking about Harrenhal for, this is the third episode now. Like, go to Harrenhal, <laughs> which they do, thank God. <laughs> but it's like, Jesus Christ, um, because it's not. Right. Damon wants Harrenhal because... It's big enough to house all of the the, the, to, to the Riverlands people. The Riverlands, but army. it's not yeah. the paramount of the Riverlands. Like the Tullys own the Riverlands, right? So yeah. it's just a silly argument to have at a council. Um, it, it, but that's just the show's way of showing that it's important. So whatever. But Kristen Cole says his plan is to march with just a couple of knights and pick up armies as he goes. Like I'll. The Captain. people who are loyal to them. Yeah, I'll rally the crown lands as I march. And by the time I get to Heron Hall, I'll have a huge army. Mm -hmm. And Allison's like, uh, what if you don't? I mean, thank God you're pretty. <laughs> 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 and uh, he says that he's not going to take Vagar. Aemon's going to stay and protect the city. And so uh, Aegon says, OK, I'll go with Sunfire. And everybody's like, ooh, we can't have the you can't go. You're the king, right? 
Uh, and even Amond says, yeah, brother, you're f- far too important, right? But it's in this like sinister, everybody knows you're a bitch kind of way. I don't know. Yeah. What did you guys think of if the vibe there? If he had two there? eyes, he would have winked at him. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I can't wink that eye, so I think that's happening for him as well. He's like, are you blinking? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Aegon almost whining says, I'm as fearsome as any. And yeah. everybody's like, you are, buddy. For yeah, sure. totally. <laughs> I- fearsome. Rawr. I think that <laughs> Aemon was totally like, you know, giving him a little jibe of like, we all know that you're an impetuous puppet right now. Like, you're not, you're not what we're all here for. We're all here for the power. You're just the person that we're using as the excuse. And so when he says like, you're way too important, bro. Like it's, it's you know, he he's being facetious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. You're way too important, What would we do without what you? What would we do without your counsel and leadership? Without you getting drunk on the throne and harassing the serving girls, how would this keep function? <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, he's a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so after this scene, we cut to Missaria, who's watching sea smoke fly around Dragonstone. And we get confirmation that she, again, it was weird kind of, they didn't show any resolution to that in episode two. Like we just saw Masaria leave the beach. Guard. <laughs> Moment. That's what she said. Um, but it's confirmation that she did save the life of Rhaenyra by warning uh, Eric with an E. She tattled. She tattled mm-hmm. from a green perspective. Yes. <laughs> Tattletale. <laughs> um, and she says in return for saving the life of Rhaenyra, she would like a place at Rhaenyra's court. And Rhaenyra's like, I thought you wanted to leave the kings uh, or the seven kingdoms. And she's like, I did, but I didn't know you were so dope and hot. So I will stay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, th- I like the reasoning that they kind of wove in here. It's like, she's like, well, you know, either you or Aegon's going to sit at the, on the iron throne by the end of this. And you were the only one that's shown any sort of mercy and um, we do know that Masaria has, you know, she has it out for the small folk. Like she really wants to protect people uh, who are lesser born. That's one of the things she did in the previous season. That's why she kind of helped Otto uh, get Aegon onto the throne because he had agreed to her that they would like close the fighting, the uh, fighting pits or whatever they called them. The child w- fights. The child fights. Mm-hmm. And I hated it. I don't think you should close them. Uh, that, that she's a tattler. No one likes a tattletale. <laughs> I've always said it. Maester Marty B. Hmm. Yeah. So Masaria will be. Well, she's also still pissed about the rat catchers. Those were her homies. Who was Masaria? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheese. She, cheese was a good man. She knew cheese. Cheese. Cheese whiz died. You know, one bad apple. I liked his dog. Cheddar. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> what was the dog's name? I hope the dog's name is Cheddar. Yeah. So it's Cheddar, Cheddar Cheese. cheese. Cheddar Biscuit. Oh, that's the duo. Um, <laughs> there's also, this is important. And again, we'll talk about it in Western inspection, but she talks about how sea smoke has been restless uh, as of late, which is just an interesting thing to say for no reason. And I have a theory there, but that's Maybe for later. Lonely could be, uh, we cut to Raina being ordered by Rhaenyra. This is, this is kind of complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it here, and maybe I got it wrong, as it, as it happened last time. Last time I tried to help, I fucked it up. Um, so Reyna is being ordered to drop Joffrey off, who's a child of Rhaenyra, the last living child of her union with Laenor, who's actually the son of Harwin, at the Vale of Arryn, right? Mm-hmm. And then continue traveling to Pentos with Viserys and Aegon, Aegon the, younger. the Younger, Aegon the Third, right? Um, so... Did I explain that well, or did I make everything worse? I think I think you got it right. Yeah, because there's also going to leave Joffrey and his dragon at the Vale as well, because that was part of the condition was her promise of to Lady, Lady Jane. Jane Aaron agreeing to you know support her was that she would send a dragon. So I sent you a dragon. It's but a it's, little one. Yeah. It's a seven-year-old and a tiny dragon, but I didn't lie. <laughs> we could fit it in this box, <laughs> <laughs> which is Taraxes. Taraxes. <laughs> Uh, but she says she needs Bela here. No, you need her dragon moon dancer. So Raina's pissed. Like she's being taken out of the fight of the, she wants to be where stuff's happening. Now she's got to go be sent to babysit uh, safe in the veil. And she's bummed and she, about and she, that. And she's always been bummed that she's never had a dragon hatch for herself. I want a dragon. Yeah. Which I, I get it. I dude, also if my it. twin sister had a dragon and I did not, I would be, I'd be pissed. such a bitch about it. Yes. Yeah. 
I would yes. be on if like if Steve and Andy had dragons and I didn't, and they were like, just go to the veil. We're gonna podcast here. Hey, can you go babysit? We're gonna be cool. <laughs> yeah. And <then> fly away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be terrible. Take the spare m- uh, microphones to the veil. Oh. <laughs> we need you in case the podcast falls. God, we would be it would be awful if Andy and I had dragons, because back then you have dragons with awesome names like Taraxes and Maylees, and I would be like, come on, Cheddar. <laughs> Pippin. <laughs> what would you name your dragon, Andy? What would I name my dragon? Bulbasaur. That's just after a Pokemon? Yeah, just after a Pokemon. Hmm. You will yield to us, sir. You will face the fire of Snickers. <laughs> Mine would be Case The goodest boy. Yours would be Case too. Mm-hmm. Just so you can say you're writing, Casey. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Way to go. No. Way to be crass, Kit Laser. Feel the wrath of Case too. I would name mine Brisket. The body of a killer. Ooh, come brisket. Mm. Have you ever been roasted by a I don't brisket? want to hear you say come brisket ever again. <laughs> it sounds like a terrible meal. You want none? <laughs> no. I've been stewing it all day. It's pretty good. It's been marinating. It's a little too salty for my taste. And then we finally see Heron Hall in the next scene. Are you Not sure time. this is Heron Hall? It is. It's Heron the, Hall? The spindly broken towers of the fortress of Heron Hall. And uh, Damon lands Caraxes on the tallest tower. Love that big red noodly boy. And then enters the decrepit castle by himself, fully clad in armor, wielding Dark Sister. And (sighs) ain't nobody there. I mean, in the book, it's like he lands Caraxes and they're like, fuck, dragon, surrender, which is what happens, right? Well, you get that one shot of someone on the go, dragon, (laughs) fuck. (laughs) But like, it would have went south for him if there were, any amount of people not surrendering in there. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. It's just interesting how they shoot it. But I do like how the castle looks and how it's all drippy and wet. wet. And you um, said, and you're totally right, it looks like fucking Dark Souls or something, like walking through this old decrepit castle and yeah. you got your armor and stuff. Uh, and like, yeah. I'm about to die 30 times trying to fight <laughs> yeah. this mini boss. Uh, yeah, you said I should play Elden Ring. I'm just not that type of gamer, dude. Yeah. Like everybody on Twitter is still playing Elden Ring, all my friends. And they're like, this boss, I died 30 times. This boss, I died 50. This boss, I only died 12. And I'm like, I would have quit. <laughs> After two. Same. Like, I play um, the, the uh, fuck, what's the Kratos games? God, God of War. I sound like an old man. <laughs> what's that one with the what's, axe guy? <laughs> what's the Italian guy that jumps on Shroom? <laughs> <laughs> so the... The God of War, I beat all the Valkyries, and in the second one, I beat all the whatever they're called. Yeah. I hate that part of the game, though, where it's like you have to try over and over. But you felt like you had to do it? It was so fun. Like, I get the appeal, but like, yeah, that is the least fun for me. I like wrecking shit through the game more than anything. So anyway, I don't think I'd like Souls games. But anyway, Simon Strong is the Castellan Mm -hmm. of, uh, it's funny because I had, I died inside during this scene because I've read fantasy novels my entire life. Right. Mm -hmm. Voraciously. But when you read words, you obviously you often pronounce them wrong out loud when you say them for the first time 20 years later. And I've said Castellan in my head for decades. That's that's what I've always said in my head. And when 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 Sir Simon said Castellan, I was like, (laughs) this is a wolf scenario and I hate it. (laughs) Um, But yeah, Sir Simon Strong yields the castle of Heron Hall to Damon and Damon's like really nervous about this right like well first we see a glimpse of alice rivers which is great yeah she walks up and like hmm. <laughs> she's all pissed we'll talk about her in a moment but they're trying to they're just eating dinner around this like king arthur table which is kind of interesting um and they're no like red, yeah. no, no red current i'm afraid no, no whatever that is it's no like a, red it's like a gooseberry did you google red did current? you google it i didn't i just did <laughs> it's a gooseberry <laughs> he's eating venison he's like that venison has been aged my lord it's delicious Damon, damon's like i'm claiming aaron harley's like apparently so yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's so gentle i actually fucking love that guy yeah, whoever plays awesome. yeah. sir simon i've considered giving him the mummer's dragon yeah i really liked the uh the heron hall scenes yeah it's great yeah um because you know damon's like ah shit i wanted to kill at least 10 people. Yeah, he's bummed about it. He yeah. beat the shit out of that guard, at least. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even kill him, though. He's like, halt! And he's like, tush, tush, tush. <laughs> shut up. So he goes in there, and they're like, hey, you're not eating anything. That venison's fire, my lord. And he's like, uh, I survived too many battles to be felled by poison peas. And uh, <laughs> I love this. I like the banter here. You know what I, I mean? I love the, the, that uh, Simon's like, poison peas? I mean, I admit uh, the uh, kitchen staff isn't that great, but it's not <laughs> <Shit>. poison. <laughs> It's an easy way to kill a dragon rider. Uh, and he's like, no, there's no way you like me. Like, what about Laris Strong? Does he support my claim here? And uh, Simon's like, we hate Laris. 
He's all, weird. All he jacks off to him. our feet all like, the time. <laughs> it's really fucking awkward. Yeah. He doesn't let us wear shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so wet around here. And he just says, put your Piggly Wigglies in the puddle for daddy. <laughs> such As a, a treat. <laughs> it's such a weird thing to say. But, but he yeah. says, hey. Go ahead. I know you're about well, to say. I was going to say, like, he's like, no, we, we hate Laris Clubfoot because, like, he pretty much just lays it out. Like, no, we know Laris is the reason behind Harwin and Lionel's death in the fire. He's like, this was the first fire that ever happened here since uh, Balerion destroyed the place. Because, as you can see, it's awfully wet mm. here. It's dingy. It's a leaky place. How it, did a fire even happen? It's hard to light a cook fire in the summer, mm -hmm. much less an accidental blaze that kills people, right? So they know that he's shady and he murdered his family. He's a kin slayer. So they're happy to surrender to Damon, right? But Damon also says, at, at one point, like he says, my like uh, Simon says, my lord. And he goes, your my grace. Prince. My prince. Or my prince. But he corrects him, your grace. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought because you're the consort. King consort. Like, yeah. No, no, king. <laughs> Me. What's funny is Sir Simon is correct. His title would be my prince still. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm pretty sure. Because like even like in our world, um, like Prince Queen Albert. Elizabeth was married to Prince Charles. And he's Prince Charles yeah. still, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's just being a little little bitch there. Because yeah. he wants to be a king so badly. It's just a petty thing that he can enforce. Me, I'm a king. But he's like, why do you even want Heron Hall? This place sucks, my prince. I mean, sorry, your I grace. Philip, not Charles, but yes. Yeah, the, the royal hounds will get you, Andy. <laughs> People love them royals. People I don't know why. They do. Uh, and he says only Heron Hall can, gra uh, can garrison the 40,000 undeclared um, river people. <laughs> um, yeah. So when you say river people, I just think of like frogmen. Just like I did of think of Alex, frogmen. friend of the show, getting turned on just now. River people. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gilman, is he part of it? I like there's there's this moment where they talk about Grover Tully and how he is too old and frail to enforce the, his uh, title as Lord Paramount of the Trident on all of his bannermen because they talk about the Brackens and the Blackwoods. And there's another cool moment where he says, uh, they've been fighting each other since the ancient times. And Damon goes, why? <laughs> <laughs> and Simon goes, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, he says, well, they should listen to Lord Grover, whatever his condition. They should listen to their liege lord. And I wonder if the writers put that in because he was so loyal to Viserys even for 15 years, he could barely move and was missing parts of his body and stuff, right? Yeah, Ooh, I, I didn't like think that. about that. I didn't think about it like that. But that that's a nice little touch, yeah. Because he's like, they should listen, whatever his condition, right? Like, uh, I just that rhymed. That, I thought that was neat. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he gives that fire ass sin begets sin begets sin. That's so good. Mm -hmm. That's like exactly what Rainier, Rainice was talking about. Yeah, it's before. the theme, man. S should be happening. Sin, be sin begets sin. And so then uh, Simon says, okay, so say all of this shit goes to plan, which I'm sure it will because you're dope, your grace. Clearly. Uh, what's the plan next? And he's like, we're going to take them all and march to King's Landing and take the throne. And Simon says, the throne? <laughs> and it's Damon says, it's a big chair says, full of swords. It's a big chair made of swords. Love it. Uh, so are we to believe that Simon Strong doesn't know about the throne? No, I think it was just Damon being a smart ass because oh, yeah. he's Simon, like, that's your move? You're yeah. going to fucking throne. attack King's Landing? Yeah, because King's Landing is not easy to take. There's, what, three walls? Concentric walls? There's a bunch. And, and there's a the, lot of castles in between there. And then the Red Keep and all that stuff. Magor's hold fast, all that shit. Yeah, it's not easy to take. Uh, we cut to Cole leaving King's Landing. We are introduced to the character of Gwen Hightower, who we've Unmasked. heard of before. Yeah. Uh, we've seen him. He, he in the was tourney? In the tourney, but yeah, he had that stupid, like, rook helmet that you know, I've got a castle head. Straight. Yeah, he had a castle head. So it's fun to, like, hey, there's Gwen. I can move as many spaces as long as it's in a straight line. Mm -hmm. So we're all using Apple products, taking our notes. Did it force you to type G Wayne? Because <laughs> no, it, it did, did for not. me. Also, at some point, somebody it is G Wayne. G Wayne. I meant like G capital G space Wayne. Oh no no no. Yeah. Um. And uh, Bela came out as Bagel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've taken Bela says Bagel. <laughs> I took my notes on paper. Oh okay. Um, but no, I think I've written this shit like so many poor. times. <laughs> we were using <laughs> my laptop. <laughs> the way you said, uh, I took my notes on paper. <laughs> <laughs> Did I do it snooty? I'm not lazy. <laughs> There's a little stank on there. <laughs> I actually took them on my phone, which sucked. Yeah, that was awful. Yeah, it made that, me puke on my mouth a little bit. Yeah. Now they're on that. I feel for you. I would have given you some paper. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> Allison forces uh, Gwen's presence on Cole's little trek, and there's some like tension there where you know she really wants her brother she's not happy with her father being banished from king's landing but she's also not happy with 
any of Cole's plans. Gwen's not happy about their father being in the I've city. traveled Even- for three months just to find that my father, who served three kings faithfully, was uh, removed from office and replaced by... A man with such modest beginnings. Mm, you're a poor. Mm. <laughs> and, Gross. And he's a Dornishman. Um, a giddying ascent to power. The people in the South have warred with the Dornish many times. So there's some, and again, so there's the Bracken and the Blackwoods, that theme. Rhaenys bringing up that no one's going to remember how the Dance of the Dragons started. Mm-hmm. And I think they threw in the Dornishman joke from Gwen to show that as well. Like, they don't even remember why they hate Dornishmen. That's just something, that, just hate them. something that people do. Yeah. Um, and then he asks for Allison's favor. Cole does. And she gives him her hanky from her breast. <laughs> and we imagine he smelled it on the journey many times. Mm, Booger's boobs. Left. I love the left one. Um, <laughs> it's my favorite one. And we got to see cheese still chilling on the wall. Rotting. Gross. P- picked apart by birdies. That's got to be a smelly street. It oh, I just had a realization. Do you remember last episode when there's that guy walking around? It's like, who are they? And they're and they sh- and that's Ulf. That's Ulf the White. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah! I just had that. I just put two and two <laughs> together there. Did you, did you know that when Ulf walked in? I, you, yeah, it was when he showed up in this episode. I was like, oh, that was him that was looking at the I, catchers. I literally just made that connection in real time right now. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> he, he's all drunk. Like, what they do? Hell well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then we go back to uh, the Black Council on Dragonstone, and they are begging Rhaenyra to utilize her dragons. Use your dragon power. No, it's it's a threat. It's best used as a threat and not an action, because once we start having dragons fighting dragons, we may lose all the dragons. Mutually assured destruction. <laughs> That's ridiculous. A sword's most best use is not in its scabbard. Yeah. Tis drawn. And sharp and stabby. And f- yeah, you're sticking with the pointy end. <laughs> stabby. And, You've been uh, exposed, my lady. She says, no, we need to just give Damon time to do his hair and hell thing he's been talking about for three episodes. Why don't you go hide and we'll stay here as bait and run the war without me? Hmm, that's treason. Good thing you just mm-hmm. thought of it and didn't do much more. So they they are. They're trying to put the put the lady to bed. This is all too much. You're too hysterical, my lady. <laughs> You're too emotional for this. This it's is not why your, women can be president. It's not your fault. So this is one of the things that I think is the weakest part of the series. And I, I think they're, I kind of feel like they're doing this intentionally, but I still think it's an unfortunate side effect where whenever we have the green council meetings, it's like, I know who all those guys are. Yeah, same. There's, there's, uh, the, there's Lannister, there's Orwell, there's Jasper Wilde. Like I all, I know who everyone's roles are. But when they cut to Rhaenyra's council, I don't know who these f- old fucks are. Like I can pull apart like, okay, that's probably a Celtigar. That's probably a, a Stokeworth Stoke and, and all this stuff. But like, I don't really know who they are character wise they're just kind of there and like okay that's the one guy that every now and then like pipes up and i, I feel like he should be killed but <laughs> <laughs> i feel like they should be. have killed him before wait the guy that looks like um what's the guy from the witch with the deep voice that's in all kinds of stuff he's awesome ralph Ennison. yeah ralph he kind of looks like ralph Ennison. that guy mm-hmm. yeah. yeah definitely kill him but ralph Ennison's been in game of thrones before right yeah yeah he's in he's one of the uh northerners right? yeah the, i think so I forget. Anyway, but 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 you know you know my point though, right? We're like it's kind of like I, I don't really understand what who they are. So whenever we cut to them, the, the council scenes are always a little like, why is there even listening to these guys? Fucking who, who cares? Like like why do you care? Uh, and I think that's something that the show hasn't done a good job of establishing thus far. I agree with point. you. I think it's a weak point. Um, they also talk about uh, well when she leaves, Rainice stops. Says I would do well to remind you that she wears the crown of Jaehaerys the Conciliator, the greatest of Targaryen kings, whose whose rule outlasted even Aegon's. Yeah, the Conqueror. And I imagine when she left, everyone was like, "What's well, not got to do with anything?" <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so cool. All right. uh, <laughs> uh, and then we see a scene between Rhaenys and Corlys, and I'm confused what they've got Corlys doing. Like he's down on the docks. He's Sitting healed now. I'm on the duck by the bird. <laughs> I'm no longer an invalid. Like, I think she brought him dinner. Yeah. Um, and she's like, Rhaenyra needs you. And he's like, well, I'm busy. So I'm building my ship. I don't know yeah. what you want from me. And they talk about their children and the the heirs to um, uh, Driftmark, right? Like, it's going to be Joffrey. Why don't you make Reyna the heir? 
A girl? <laughs> <laughs> Honey, I know our whole relationship started out with you being denied the crown, and I thought that was an injustice. But whenever you bring up another girl being denied something, I think it's hilarious. It's so cute. <laughs> I actually um, thought that the body language of this scene was really sweet. Yeah, um, yeah like, they do love each other. love the fuck out of each other. And the way that they're like leaning on the, I don't know, piece of wood together. It's yeah. It's very sweet. And yeah. Corliss is a sub that likes to get pegged. We found that out last yeah, episode. Totally. <laughs> Which is cool. That's yeah, cool to, for me to know. Yeah, the blocking of the scene really does kind of, I think the blocking does a lot of work in uh, selling their relationship because especially in the last couple episodes, because when, when when the series started, you were like, oh yeah, Corliss and Rainey's are ride or die. They love each other. Probably the most pure relationship in the show. But then by the end of the first season, you're like, oh, Corliss is being kind of a dick to her, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so this was really good in establishing. No, there really is this like There's a wedge between them and, though. Yeah, there is a wedge between them. It's mm -hmm. true. It's beautiful block. And it's wood. Mm -hmm. Should you strap up, my lady? Not now, Corliss. Well, then I've got things to do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, My safe word is sea snake. <laughs> <laughs> we cut to the goodbyes. Um, this is Rhaenyra saying goodbye to all of her children. And it's quite touching. You know, Joffrey, Viserys and Aegon are all being sent away along with Reyna, who gets a, a goodbye with Bela. And she's like, don't coddle me. At least, you know, don't make it sound like I'm doing something cool. But they give her a bunch of eggs. I think it's four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's four eggs. In the book, it's three dragon eggs to send with her to um, the Pentos. House of the Veil. Vale. Well, oh, yeah, eventually, Pentos, yeah, yeah, but yeah, 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 to the Veil. Vale. Yeah. And she's also sending two young dragons, Stormcloud and Taraxes. And Taraxes is Joffrey's young dragon uh, to Lady Jane to mollify her so they can send, hopefully, the, the troops of the Veil. Vale. Um, and this is uh, going to be discussed a lot more in Westeros Spection. But for now, I just think it's a touching scene where she has to say goodbye to her children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's cute because you get to like you said she's saying goodbye to them. It's sweet. Jace hugging uh, yep. Joffrey is especially sweet because you know Jay Bird, Jay Bird, love him. And then uh, Reyna and Bela hug goodbye. A lot of twins in this show. We and got twins: Tyland and Jason Lannister. Yeah, Eric and Eric, of course, mm -hmm. and Reyna and Bela. They're everywhere. It's a lot mm -hmm. of twins. Twinning. Gross. And twins. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> and then we get the twins. You know the fray. Yeah. The twins of the phrase. Uh, and then we get a scene between Helena and Alicent where Helena's like, I'm a little sad about my son being beheaded. And Alicent's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but also not because like kids die a lot. Right. Um, and again, to Andy's point, they brought up the theme of how the small fat smoke, <laughs> small smoke, small folk react to the wars of high lords. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, because she's like, but again, you know, the people that saw me at the funeral, like they were probably felt like they had more of a right to grieve than I do. They lose their babies a lot more than high board people do probably. Yeah. She's got like survivors and um, survivors guilt and imposter syndrome at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and Allison's like, no, you have every bit the right to grieve as everyone else. The stranger comes for us all. And then Helena basically out of nowhere is like, I forgive you. And that strikes Allison. Like she's almost overcome with emotion because of course she does feel obscenely guilty that she was writing coal pole while her family was being assaulted and murdered. Right. Yeah. It's a touching scene. Uh, we it is interesting, though, because, like, shouldn't Helena be, like, going mad at this point after the death of uh, J. Harris? Yes. And so, like, she was, I when they, when this scene started, I thought that, like, we were about to see some of that. Uh, and she's, that was, like, more lucid than she's ever been mm -hmm. in the show, which I thought was really surprising. Well, it's kind of interesting because in the books, you're right. Like, they talk about how Helena goes mad and is inconsolable and no one understands what anything she's saying. And it's, and the show's almost positing that maybe that will become propaganda to explain the way Helena already is yes. where she's aloof and uh, prophetic and no one knows what she's talking about to begin with, but they use this tragedy to sort of explain how hmm. she is in a patriarchal way. Yes. Like, Oh, she couldn't handle it. She's a woman. She couldn't handle the action. Now she's all quiet. Yeah. While she's the only one who's like, yeah, I kind of feel bad. <laughs> I agree. And I like that take. Um, that's what I was thinking as well. Uh, they cut to Aegon, who disobeying his counsel is now readying for war with his dude bro Kingsguard. Uh, yeah, his homies from before are Kingsguard now. Yeah. That's awesome. He's Kappa Kappa White Cloaks. He's, we <laughs> <laughs> he's wearing uh, Aegon the Conqueror's Valyrian steel armor, but it's ill-fitting. <laughs> he looks so terrible. Which it. is, you know, 
characterization. Yeah. And then Laris intercedes, who knows that it's not wise that Aegon rides, uh, flies into battle. And so he comes in and, and uses his wiles to say, oh, I think it's great you're going to war, my lord. However, some people might say, and they are saying that it's uh, so that Alicent can lead. And it's great that you're leaving because you're a douche. And, uh, and you everyone stink. likes Aemon better. And the counts, the castle will smell better in your absence. Well, I think it's wild. I yeah, love the way you smell. You smell beautiful to me. The yeah. average dick size will go way up. <laughs> <laughs> Without your presence here, my lord. I've also heard some people saying the property value will go up in King's Landing with the moment you leave. Mm. Which I don't agree. I think it's very high right now. And in this market, it's not going to get any higher. Thanks to your, your policies, my lord. I do have a realtor's license. Would you like to see a nice country home? <laughs> He's trying to sell him a house. <laughs> it's got 47 privies. Have you ever heard of a timeshare, my lord? <laughs> I like you, Laris. My father had no taste for a master of whispers, but I, I think I should have one and it should be you. So he promotes him to master of whispers, which was Varys's old title. Um, pretty cool, pretty cool. So um, do you th is he still the, the king's... Lord Confessor. Lord Confessor? I'd imagine. Hmm. It's always been a silly title. Everyone's getting two jobs and no more yeah. pay <laughs> this episode. I made a lot of comparisons to Varys and Laris, and I made a funny joke that said the only difference between them is a big L. Because uh, mm -hmm. Varys is cool and Laris sucks. And uh -huh. everybody was like, you're dumb. He's much more like Littlefinger. So I feel pretty vindicated. I'm not going to rub it in that he's got the literal same job now. But uh, fuck you. I was right. <laughs> Just rub it. <laughs> <laughs> for the, yeah, for the YouTubers, Andy rubbed it in. Um, and he tells his boys, I think I shall fly another day. And they're like, <laughs> Tally ho. That's what I was thinking. Martin has a squire. Very wise. Very wise. Uh, yeah. And they talk about this squire that needs uh, to get laid for the first time and how they're going to go out and all get laid together. And he's like, you guys have sworn a vow of chastity now. And they're like, <laughs> totally. Good one, my lord. And then he's serious. So they're like, oh. Yeah, I, I oh, really. No. But I is really... he serious? Because then he goes out with them anyway. Well, uh, he, well, he gets so get so get drunk and party. I, I like what they're doing with Aegon's character in the show where he's this shit of a person who f finds himself like earnestly trying to do a good job whether it's for his own image or just he just wants to live up to the standard of a king mm -hmm. and even though he's like definitely not going to ever meet it i just love the fact that they're painting him as this guy who like at least wants to put in the effort in some shape it mm -hmm. makes him more interesting of a character than what he is in the books for totally. sure yeah uh and then we get the introduction of a character that will be very important but that's all we'll say for now. Ulf. Ulf the White. Ulf the Sot, Which, some people call him. He likes to ask, drink. Is it Mardi Gras every night in Flea Bottom? Because yeah, every yeah, time dude, we go to hard. Flea Bottom, it's like the streets are packed with people just wild. And that's I'm more and more confident that were I to be in this universe, I would be in Flea Bottom. Every time I see Flea Bottom, I'm like, yep. Would you be clapping cheeks? No. <laughs> getting them clapped, but still. You're getting them clapped. I like to party. <laughs> yeah. I'm more like Corliss in that regard. I don't think it's too bad. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the Westerosi equivalent of like going to the club, you know? Sure. It's the popular bar. It's Vegas. It's Zazu's. <laughs> <laughs> All the babies here are money, baby. <laughs> A little swingers reference? Yeah. <laughs> so Olaf is saying over his cups that he is the bastard son of Balon the Brave, who is the father of Damon and Viserys. So he claims that Damon and Viserys are his half brothers. And he is a dragon seed, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't really believe him because he doesn't have quite the hairdo that he should. But right as he's saying, uh, basically declaring for Rhaenyra, Aegon walks in. I love the the one dude that's drinking with him. He's like, oh no, it's your other nephew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I almost said uncle, but I think you're right. And then, uh, yeah, so Aegon shows up. He's got, he's got his boys there. They're going to deflower uh, the squire. Uh, and in the They're back. They're going to do it? Well, part of it. <laughs> and in the back, apparently it's a brothel in the back, right? And we get to see, there's a, there's there's some stuff going on. <laughs> some we get to see, a, there's a Hawk Tua back there. A full on Hawk Tua. They show the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, shaft and everything. Start to finish. <laughs> okay, they don't show all that. No. Did you tell? I'm, now, I'm sorry, this might be too like crass to discuss, but as the mm -hmm. resident show me that dick guy on the podcast, sure. I got, uh, do you think that was a real dick or was no, it like a no. prosthetic? Because it looked like a Muppet. What a childish <laughs> question. You think somebody's really, now get hard. <laughs> I mean, that the unsimulated sex has it, been shown before, yeah, but yeah, not right. in, in an HBO show. I'm just saying, that's why I was wondering, like, ooh, like imagine the casting call. We need a guy with a decent dick and wants to get it sucked. <laughs> I would like what to apply. lines out the door <laughs> around the block. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Easy role to cast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like we, we've uh, talked before about like the house, of the dragon showrunners being conscious of uh, maybe a little too much uh, being shown back in the day of uh, game of Thrones. And this one was like pouring one out for the homies or something <laughs> like that. They, uh, Porn, for Steve, for sure. Out for the homies? I mean, the, this they were was, like, Steve wants dick. This went further than Game of Thrones ever did, right? With full on blowy penetration. Yeah, I sure. Mean, it's a wild brothel scene. There's some stuff going on in the background. There, and and Aegon is just spoiling everybody's fun. He's opening curtains left and right. Oh, oh we I know, know, right? Oops, oh, whoops. Uh, they really should have a, a vacant or no occupancy sign above these rooms. It says a lot about Aegon too, because if Aegon wanted to party, he's the king, right? Come to my house. Right. Yeah, you come to me. Like I'm alcohol only, you know. But no, yeah. he's coming in. I want to go out into Flea Bottom and travel and walk around with just a few nights and just look at everybody's. I want to see the small folks' wares. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no paparazzi in this world. You know? And he, he finds with it. his brother Amon in the back with the original prostitute that he had had his brother deflowered with, and he thinks it's hilarious that he's still with, besotted with his older woman. And I made a lot of light of this uh, a couple episodes ago, and I, I've kind of regretted it and felt bad about it ever since because there is an element of uh, of, of of abuse to this, right? Because he went to this older woman when he was a kid, and they had them have sex with her, you know had her have sex with him, mm -hmm. and now he's just with her ever since, right? So there's some there's an element of abuse there, but I think you do need to take it into account of the, this society, right? And when they come of age and I do think there's some definite mommy issues with Amon is what they're trying to illustrate here. Yeah. Uh, and Aegon thinks it's hilarious. He's always picked on Amon, even though Amon could beat the shit out of him easily. And Amon is like taken back to when he was a kid for a moment. And you know, uh, the pink dread, all of that is flooding back in. I can kind of see it in his face that he's, they're all going to laugh at you. They're all going to laugh at you. Right. And so he takes it in that moment to stand up and act like he doesn't care about this woman at all. We see his pink dread. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. You've been sitting on I've that. Been, <laughs> I've, Chris was doing a really great, uh, a sentimental, important point, And I'm just like, you're like dread penis. <laughs> like the whole bouncing. time. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we do. We get to see that thing. I was really worried we weren't going to see it because he stood up and like, oh, they're going to cut away or they're going to have like one of his boys stand up and block it. But nope, there we go. We saw the full frontal thing of Eamon One-Eye. Hmm. <laughs> That's what they mean by Eamon One-Eye. <laughs> Eamon's One-Eyed Monster. This episode of Streaming Things is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp. You know, Steve, is there something I need to get off my chest? What's that, fella? It's been weighing on me. You know that I resigned at the day job recently, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been a little scared. There's a family to worry about. There's health insurance. There's mm -hmm. capitalism. Sounds like a stressful time. But we all carry around different stressors, big and small. It feels better when you bring something to the light and keep them bottled up. It can start to affect us negatively. And therapy is a safe space to get things off your chest and to figure out how to work through whatever's weighing you down. In my case, it's all of the stress, the misery, the fear. But I had to come over here and share that with you. And I felt better. You know, that's a real thing that happened. Yeah. Uh, unloading all that on you and Erica and feeling better myself. That uh, sounds like my Friday night. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you're not vibing, that's completely fine. So get it off your chest with better help visit betterhelp.com slash streaming things to get 10 percent off your first month that's better help h-e-l-p.com slash streaming things it's the month of june and it's a very special month because our patreon tiers just got a huge upgrade at patreon.com slash streaming things and i want to thank the very special patrons who signed up to be super patrons of streaming things keeping the lights on for us day in and day out so thank you so much to album stink pot digimon digital monsters with a much longer name but i'm only saying those three words dylan dunkley's stanton valentino Mattelstat, Susie callahan anthony corona parmesan sun 
Sunshine, Ashley Hazen, Just Liz Calabria, Mike from New Hampshire, Brett X, Emily Scarano, Lil Tickler, Svento7, Jay Scramo, Bloth Pum, AK Ashley Ray, Adam Busby, Wendy O'Laughlin, Big Butthorn, Conrad, Jer Lektanovich, Kaylee Sampson, Rabbit Dog in a Barbie Car, Elpander, Charlie Friday, Alexis Adler, Peaches, Emmy, Haley B, Joe Velez, John Collins, Trisha Bueller, Sun Loving Mortal, Suzanne Rowe, Jen Robinson, Kalisha Reeves, Paula Garcia, Kevin Strother, Ashley Powers, Stephen V, Casey McCain, and Enza. Thank you all so much for supporting Streaming Things. And with that, let's get back to this episode. So from this scene, we cut to uh, Rhaenyra, who's like looking through her own little saved Legos of her daddy and stuff. She's got her own little trinkets. And in there is a tiny letter uh, that was born on a raven, most like, from Alison Hightower, because it's got the Hightower seal, wax seal on it, unopened. Yeah, and she had told Rainey's earlier that Alison had sent her a letter shortly after Luke's death, but she hadn't opened it yet to read it. What's the password to your Netflix account? What if that's all it said? <laughs> <laughs> I can't get in. Dear Rhaenyra, Crispy Cole and I are totally doing it. <laughs> that makes us sisters in another way. <laughs> then we cut to Cole and company. They are on uh, the road to Heron Hall. And uh, Gawain is arguing with him. He's still being a shit because he's highborn. I want to stop at an inn and party. I'll be here later unless the wine's good. I'll be even later. And while and Cole doesn't recommend that, we can't stop at an end. We have to be sneaky. And at that moment, he spies Bela on Moon Dancer in the sky. It's oh no! So cool because it's teeny itty bitty bitty on the screen, like up there. By I was the sun. I, I never found it. I'll be honest. Really? Oh, it's like right next to the sun, and it's like a little speck. It's yeah. awesome. Ah, well, I like from her POV. She just sees the glint of mail. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so that must mean there's a person down there. It's really well done. But they're all terrified, right? So they make for the trees. We're exposed. And it's like a quick horror sequence from the point of view of Cole and Gwen and, and company. Moon Dancer is gorgeous. I love yeah. that dragon. It's, it, it looks, I I so appreciate in this series how they make the dragons look very different from each other. So when you see even just their heads, you're like, oh, that's. Caraxes. Oh, that's Vagar. Like even uh, Moon Dancer has a very different head shape. Uh, compared to the other dragons, like uh, the head shape almost looks like, I don't know if this might be too deep of a cut, but the the bad guy aliens from Galaxy Quest, the green lizard people, like that's what uh, Moon Dancer's oh, head looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's got like the little scales that kind of look like like hairs, kind of. It's it's neat. It's, it's, it's a very cool, cool dragon design. This sequence is awesome. It's so scary. You know what I mean? Even though those are bad guys, I don't want them to get eaten. It's like fucking little jaws scene. Run, Gwen, run! G Wayne, <laughs> they make it just in time, and and Bela was kind of dis disobeying Rainier there. She went way lower than she was supposed to, and almost and would have engaged them. It looked like, but she could have just said Dracaris. She definitely could have, but she, and then she would have started a forest fire, and that would have never been forgiven. Uh, but she flies back up. She can't find him, and Gawain is terrified, and he's like kind of bowing to Cole at this point, and like I'm so sorry. You're a cool, man. I like Dornish, man. I didn't tell you. I didn't. <laughs> what now? I do. I Dornish mean, red is my favorite wine. You're one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, at that point, Cole is like, all right, we're going to keep going only at night, only in the trees and no fucking ends. Right. So mm -hmm. now he's fully in charge. Bela goes to report to the council back she on Dragonstone. Tattles. She's a tattler as well. Her and Masaria, they're thick as thieves. Um, and uh, she tells them, hey, Cole's out. I, I'm almost positive it was him. How could you see him from so high? Well, I wasn't that high. No, no, no. I only had one joint. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> And all the other uh, council members of this are like, seriously, Rhaenyra, you have to use the dragons now for realsies. Please root out Colin Burnin. And she looks at Rhaenys, doesn't seem to know quite what to do and says, I've heard your arguments. I will consider them. And then she walks away. We then cut back to Damon at Heron Hall. And the way that I read this scene is that he's in his bedroom and he doesn't trust anyone there still. So he's barred the door with swords. And then he's having some kind of waking nightmare vision spurred on by Alice Rivers, right? Because she is rumored in the books to have the powers of, of a witch. Um, and I really love how they're handling this, but there's pounding on the door. So he's a brave man. So he draws dark sister and unbars it. And hello. Hello. I didn't it, order any door dash. At first I thought that he had barred the door with dark sister and I, I was like, too. Oh, that's genius. They'll never fucking break that. Valyrian steel. Yeah. Um, but then he draws dark sister. And I was like, Oh no, he just used a regular sword. That's cool. Two swords, but then, that's yeah. strong. 
Nobody's at the door. So he starts uh, uh, terrified, kind of, well, not terrified, but like warily mm. walking around with his drawn sword. And he goes into the other, like the solar of the apartments. And there, sitting there, sewing back on the head of the dead Jaharis, is Millie Alcock. Millie! Oh! Millie! Young, young Rhaenyra. Yes. How fun. And she had said she would not be back for this. So she Fucking was being coy. Fire. So and good. in such a good sequence, too. And he's horrified to see his dirty work there. You know yeah, what I mean? She's sitting there sewing the fucking baby's head back on. You always do shit and I have to clean it up. Oh, my God. So fucking yeah. good. And then he suddenly finds himself uh, in the godswood, drops his sword. What a cool godswood that Heron Hall has, mm -hmm. right? That's bad. Very cool. And Alice Rivers is there. You will die in this place. No, I won't. No. Uh -uh. Made me think of uh, Evil Dead 2013. Um, when a girl gets possessed, she like pukes all over and she's like, you're all going to die here and then passes out. You're all going to die here. Good oh, shit. Love you. Good shit. Uh, we cut to uh, Rhaenyra who goes to Masaria and asks for, do you know Alison's movements? Well, y yes, your grace. She does throw ass quite well. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to speak with her and she knows she needs to know how she moves about the Red Keep. Oh, I can get her a message easily. No, she wouldn't believe a message. She would think it was a trap. I know I would. I need to see her face to face. So they come up with this Mission, mission Impossible ploy to dress her up like a septa. Uh, how and fun was that? Just, mm. It really was Mission Impossible. Like they oh, it's put such in a the, good sequence. Dun, 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 with her dun. and the, the, the guard. I wish I knew the guard's name. but like Yeah, that fucking guy. Dun, dun, dun. And he's terrified because at any moment, if, he, if they are discovered, if she is recognized... But they're not going to recognize her because any woman who's not dressed to be alluring to men or dressed like a queen won't be noticed, is what uh, Masaria says. But if they are, all he's got is a little dagger. And he's like, oh, <laughs> back, back, back. Oh, I'll poke you. I'll, I, th I feel like I'll we got to call them Specs because anybody that's helping out the infiltrator guy, they're always named Specs. Mm. Spe I mean, like like spectacles, like glasses. glasses. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, so she sneaks in as a septa and goes to the sept. Where, where they can find Allison alone. Um, and they're back at that, you know, I forget what it's called, like a dais kind of of candles so that they, they used to, to, to yap at each other as children, right? Um, so there's something really iconic about this meeting place. And there's this moment where she comes up and lights the candle and Allison's like super annoyed because someone's in her space, which is <laughs> totally how it is. That was the most genuine reaction I've ever seen an actor on a show have. Just like I've done that same exact face uh -huh. where someone walks up in your space like, OK, it's uh -huh. like when you're like on a subway and you're somebody sits next to you, even though there's tons of other seats like mm. I was going to say like urinals in the men's room. You yeah. Know? <laughs> There, you need at least a gap. Yeah. A gap urinal. If there's if 10 possible. of them and then you come pee right next to me. Yeah. Yeah. God, you're just trying to Peter watch, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am, my lord. <laughs> uh, and then Rhaenyra, so Rhaenyra has like a little dagger and Allison is horrified at first. Like, oh my God, you're about to kill me, right? Like, this is an assassination. I don't know why you came personally. What a ballsy move. <laughs> like, that's what's running through her head. And, and Rhaenyra's like, no, 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 it's cool. I just want to talk. I just want to talk. And what if I call out? <laughs> Well, then I'll die for sure, but not before I kill you. And Allison's like, okay. And Rhaenyra's like, okay, I've begun badly. I've begun badly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so it, like, it is, hey, it is kind of been? funny to have someone like have enough, like, I just want to talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Draw a gun pointed at you, just like, hey, man, been a long time. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Let's she, just chat. She had to, like, you know, come yes. correct. Because because what's going to stop Allison from just yelling out if she didn't have that dagger? Yeah. So and there's a yeah, it makes sense that she would do that. And it's a really long scene, but essentially she's like, hey, and, you know, we've always known men want to fight. They're ready for it. They, they, they're they going to push this along because that's what they want to do. Um, and I want you to help me stop this. We'll come to some kind of peace terms. Right. And Allison holds her ground. She's like, you don't even have an army. Peace what? Peace out. <laughs> get a piece of this. That's what, and she's like, these nuts, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and she's like, uh, Viserys changed his mind. You are no longer who he wanted to succeed him. And, and Allison truly believes this because of those dying words. And at the end of season one, and I thought for a second, they were going to leave it there and I was going to be sick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then finally Rainier is like, what did he say? I was like, thank God. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and Allison eventually is like, 
Well, he, he said, spoke Aegon's name. He said Aegon. You know, nobody else is named Aegon. It could have only been him. Yeah, he mumbled a lot. And <laughs> let's be real. I he, couldn't understand half of it, but he did say Aegon was the prince that was promised to unite the realm. He was missing half his face. Uh, but yeah, he said something about the prince who was promised. And like, it's so well acted. The, the face that Rhaenyra makes. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? Right? And then... When she says, no, that's the story he used to tell all the time, the face that Allison makes. So you can tell she's like, oh, oh no. no. Um, but it's, it's gone it's too far. It's a story he once told about Aegon the Conqueror. Uh, Aegon the Conqueror. He mm. spoke to you about the Song of Ice and Fire? And she's like, what? what, what? Huh? <laughs> and there's this line that Rhaenyra says, like, we have to stop this. Even a victory may be so bloody as to be counted as a loss. Oh, I got chills. Mm. Um, and Allison says, it's too late, Rhaenyra. And she leaves. Yeah, don't the last pride ditch effort. You, there, there's been a mistake. Well, she says, "My father's gone. Cole's on the march, and you know what Amen is. It's too. Uh, it's her fucking son. Yeah, He's like, you know what he is. He, he. Oh my god. He's a little crazy. Oh my. He likes god. to kill. He got a big dragon. Mm. Mm-hmm. He's got one eye. It creeps everybody out. I don't like it even. Uh, and that's the end of the episode, dude. That's the big. <sighs> woo. What an end, right? Like, oh. like just. I love how the show keeps. Changing like you're like as a book reader, it 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 changes things in the books, but in such a believable way. But it adds more context, drama, everything. So so good. Like I love how they end it. Where oh, both of them know that this was a mistake, but it's they've gone too far that they can't really correct it. Or at least Allison doesn't want to correct it. Um, yeah. Wow. Such a great scene. Heartbreaking. So now that brings us to our Valyrian steals. It's going to be a hard choice, boys. Andy, what are you going for number three of your top three favorite moments of this wonderful episode? Um, I'm going to go with the opening with the Blackwoods and the Brackens Um, for all the reasons I said at the start of this episode. um, Just that I love seeing the small folk and how um, little squabbles can become big ones when you find yourselves on uh, either side of uh, the powers that be uh, and their conundrums it's kind of like you know family that disagree in politics and then you're in an election year and then all of a sudden you are uh more at each other's throats than maybe you otherwise would have been you know um and i just thought that the acting was really effective um especially i thought from the bracken kid that seemed so terrified and the cut to the carnage afterwards the battle of the burning mill was uh sucks to not see it but you don't need to you know all you need to know is what the end result was and it was just a whole lot of death Uh, i thought it was really really effective way to open it steve what about you that is also my number my number three uh for everything you just said i I, it's just it's it's a it's a nice change of pace like to the point where even when we watch it accidentally like we said at the top of the show i was like wow what a brave idea to open the season with the brackens and blackwoods it's and it's a neat choice to open this episode with them as well. And I really like how they use the this family's history as the um, sort of the theme of of this episode of, of sin begetting sin. And and it is a, a, a small, tiny, short film that's a tragedy because, like you said, there's this these two kids that <clears throat> don't really know why they're fighting. And the one kid's trying to, like, step up and protect the name of his family and then just smash cuts to him with a, like a lance in his neck dead on the ground. And it's just kind of a bummer and sad. Like, uh, well, that didn't need to happen, but all these people are dead because of this awful, awful thing that has been set in motion that no one can go back from. Um, and it's a good way to sort of legitimize what Allison says at the end when she's like, it's too late to go back on her promises because all these people have already died in the name of this war. So how can you be like, sorry guys, misunderstanding right. my bad uh so, so yeah it's a really fun scene i don't know what to choose for my number three um there's that the the scene between helena and allison and uh rainier's goodbye to her children are all standing out to me but i think i really have to talk about damon landing on caraxes and the slow walk through the abandoned heron hall which is this like decrepit massive fortress that's so foreboding and evil because it's so much death and pain has taken place there, culminating in this hilarious interaction with Simon Strong. And I love Simon Strong so much. So that's my number three, the dinner with Simon Strong. Um, I love it so much. And the, and the poison peas. peas. Andy, your number two. <laughs> my number two is uh, Damon's dream sequence. Um, it hints at uh, what's to come 
I can't wait to get more of Alice Rivers. Um, she's such an interesting character and I can't wait to see what the show does, how it adapts the truth of the story and what she is and what she's capable of and who she becomes. Um, and not least because it's like this tiny little horror sequence. Uh, it's also the return of Mille and I, uh, loved her so much in season one. And I was so happy to get a, uh, a little, a little cameo. And in this badass fucking horrifying, sewing a dead baby's head on type of sequence, it was just all the things, you know, my favorite character with my favorite actress from the previous season. And then it being like this crazy fucked up scene, everything about it was just like, this is a scene for Andy. Mm -hmm. Steve, I, I, this is hard because there are a bunch of really great scenes. Like uh, I love the scene with Damon getting into Heron Hall and talking to Sir Simon. But I think my number two is going to be Andy's number two. I think Andy and I are just vibing this episode. Yeah, you got it, buddy. Uh, it's going to be a we all everybody for you guys. I, I feel so. I feel oh, like yeah. it is. Uh, no way. No, yeah. I mean, for everything you just said, it's a fun little mini horror film sequence and crescendoing with the return of 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 Millie as young Rhaenyra. And it's just so good to see her again. And uh, yeah, that's my number two. I agree with you guys. That's my number two as well. That's a that's a fucking phenomenal scene. Uh, it seems so out of place and wonderful. And it's so great to kind of nod to the book readers with the rumors of Alice Rivers and what she's capable of, but also show so much about Damon's character and show some regret there, which we don't get a lot for Damon. In that regard, he seems to kind of just kind of be like, oh, well, I did it. Um, yeah, he's like tearing up and shit. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, of course, yeah, seeing Millie Alcock was just uh, so phenomenal and such a good surprise. So that's my number two as well. Could only be beaten. I love that moment so much. There's only one scene that could have beat it. I think we're all going to agree on that as well. Andy, you're yeah. number one. It's Rainier and Allison meeting at the end. Yeah, like, It's got to be that for all of us, right? Agreed. We all, everybody. Yeah. It's just, phenomenal scene. You know. And they let it go for so long, Two too. Friends for, exactly. It's a you know? really long scene, but they, great. They got all of the things, and especially when you said, and I was so with you, because they could have so easily have continued a misunderstanding and you get that so often in movies where it's like, why didn't you ask the question, you know, and that would have solved so much. She does ask the question, like what was said and like the, um, the stakes change and like the power dynamics change so much throughout it where Rainier becomes convinced like, oh my God, he really changed his mind. Like I was mm -hmm. just with him. I know you were with him last. He, he actually, and she starts crying and stuff. And then like the dynamic shifts again when it's like, you, what was that about the prince? You know, like. Good Which shit. egg on? <laughs> uh, Steve, what about you? It's the same for me. It, it, it's, I've talked about it earlier. It's such a great scene. And Andy spoke so well about the power dynamics changing. And I just love how it ends on this, it, this already tragic tale of two friends growing up apart and then starting a war uh, in their individual's names, individual sons and heirs' names. Like it's, it becomes even more tragic when the truth is finally realized and both of them realize like, oh, he never, Viserys never did waver in his support of Rhaenyra and just at the fear in Allison's face of like, oh my God, oh no, but we can't stop now. It, it just makes the series so much more tragic and everything that's going to happen from here on out is going to be that much more sad because of this scene. This scene does so much uh, for the story. And I, I love that they included it. And it's not something that is in the book at all. It adds so many more layers to the story. Just this one scene. I'm so glad they did it. Were they running short on time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People who uh, listen to our Game of Thrones coverage know that some of the best scenes in the first season of Game of Thrones were a result of them running short on time. So they just made shit up. And uh, I hope that's not, I don't think that's the case in this. I think right. they probably, this seems more deliberate. No, I agree with you guys. I can't add anything as to why, but this is just one of the best scenes in this show's history. The scene between uh, Rainier and Allison in the Sept. And I adored it so much. Also, just want to throw it in. Uh, I don't know why Rainier looks so good as a Septa, but <laughs> oh, yeah. that says something about me. But I was like, oh, oh I don't think that's going to, I don't think she's going to hide very well. My well, queen. The, the, I thought she was supposed to not be alluring. The shame lady from season, what was that, five or something? She looked just like her. And. I mean, that, shame, that shame on was, me. That that woman was, boss? Yeah, that, she's so <laughs> fucking gorgeous. Oh, I love her. Uh, so, yeah, we we agree on our top two. You guys agree on all three of your top three. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We're simpatico, baby. Next. Which brings us to our dragon eggs, 
Um, Andy, what do you got uh, by way of? I got nothing. We covered it all during. Uh, it was all going to be Bracken and Blackwood stuff, and then we but, talked about all of it. Well, there's more to talk about for sure with the Bracken and Blackwoods. Well, it's yours now, right? The your dragon eggs. I mean, well, I I just wanted to point out that the enmity between those two families goes back a thousand years, not centuries. They were the, mm -hmm. one of the. They were among the houses of the first men before the Andals even came. And they do, in fact, not remember why they hate each other. And that's a really fascinating thing. Do you think it might be religion? That like, yeah. it was, was it the Blackwoods that started following the Seven first? Uh, I doubt it because they're the ones that follow the Targaryens more loyally, oh, historically. I also think it's funny that the Blackwoods are always loyal but never get anything from it. Like, they didn't get a marriage with Rhaenyra. Um, uh, even all the way back to Aegon, they were the first to claim for Aegon, the conqueror. Mm -hmm. uh, but he made the Tullys Lord Paramount of the Trident. Like they keep getting fucked over, even though they're loyal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, they, they, each, they each think that, you know, I think it's the Brackens that think that the Blackwoods were their vassals and then, you know, uh, betrayed them. And the Blackwoods think that uh, Brackens were their vassals and nobody even remembers. And it's, it's just really fascinating. Uh, but also the Bracken and the Blackwoods were the two boys in season one that got in the fight and one of them died. It's the Bracken so died. Badass. Yeah. It was the Bracken that said, the queen has a dragon, you dumb cunt. Mm -hmm. Like they just hate each other. That was an excuse for them to fight. Um, I also, there was another mention of Jaehaerys the Conciliator. We've talked a lot about that history there, but just to remind dear listener uh, that he was the king who ruled for decades and decades and helped build the roads and, and the King's Road, yeah. made the most headway into establishing the kingdom and its actual laws. Wasn't uh, because of, um, uh, I forget who it was, but they they went to the wall, uh, King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne, they went to the wall yeah. and they convinced them to give the watch more money. And because of them, that's why they have East Watch by the sea. Is that the castle that, or no, one of the castles was creepy. Uh, the, creeped out Alisane and she's like, close that castle down and we'll give you money to build a new one because that one's way too creepy. Yeah, it's the Dreadfort, I think. Dreadfort, yeah. Uh, the one that's all scary when we get to that in Game of Thrones. Yeah, yes, um, yes. They're the reason that some of them are shut down and they have some more funding, but it's also, they're the ones that tried to fly dragons over the wall and couldn't. Yeah, all that stuff. I mean, and Alison did all kinds of stuff. She listened to the women of the kingdom, uh, the law of the first night, which was uh, prima nocta in, real, in our real world where the Lord could demand to have sex with the local bride um, was done away with because of her. Like she mm -hmm. did all kinds of good stuff. Um, so yeah, that's Jaehaerys and that's why he's so well regarded. Is there anything iconic about his crown? Um, he's the first one that made his own crown because the other one was kind of scary. Hmm. And, you know, so Aegon the Conqueror had this like, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's like a, black valyrian steel it's, crown it's with the red one rubies. that current aegon wears in the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a silvery with like red rubies on it and he decided to wear a gold one because only um anis magor and aegon wore the one that aegon the second now wears and jaharis made a gold one uh, and, then, and he was more about truth and love and beauty and mm -hmm. laws you know which one did um viserys wear viserys wore jaharis the gold yeah, one gotcha. and then that crown now is uh, on Rhaenyra's head gotcha. currently. Yes. Uh, the rest of my eggs are going to be Westeros faction because I want to talk about a bunch of other stuff. So okay. do you have any dragon eggs, Steve? Uh, they mentioned Prince Reggio, who is the mm. uh, nominal, uh, Heritas Reggio is the nominal ruler of the free city of Pentos. Um, and he was the guy in the first season that was hosting Damon and Lena who was like, hey, you guys can live here forever. We love your dragons. Oh, yeah. That's the guy that they're sending Reyna to uh, in Pentos. Um, when Damon is going through Harrenhal, there was some like tattered sigils and banners. And I was really trying to figure out whose banners that was because it wasn't immediately obvious to me. And that is the banners of House Strong. Because um, because at first I'm like, it would make sense that the House Strong banners are there, but I don't really know House Strong's banner, to mm -hmm. be honest. It's like a, a, a black hand that's sort of framed uh, with a design and then like red... I think red, blue, and white kind of wavy lines kind of like are leaving it or emanating from it. It's an interesting design for a banner, but that is what's being held at How Strong. And uh, I'll save the other one for West Respection just in case. Okay. Just in case. Uh, which brings us to our Mummer's Dragon segment, our nomination for our favorite performance of the episode. Andy, who are you going to bequeath? I'm going to give it to Olivia Cook. I thought that her scene with her daughter... Um, it will really almost every scene that she's in, she is, uh, kind of being forced to reckon with 
a situation beyond her control that has spiraled beyond any of her expectations. When she's with uh, Kristen Cole, she's, you know, she's angry, but still, you know, into him, but like wants to get rid of him. She's upset about her having her father being sent away. And then we get her with her daughter and like the grief that she has over the loss of her grandson, but also like the guilt that she ex is experiencing. And so much of it is unspoken, you know, it's all in the way that she's saying her performance hinges so much on the things that she doesn't say. And it's, that's so effective. And then her scene with, um, Rhaenyra at the end, and that's no longer about the things she doesn't say, but the way that she is portraying the things that she does and like the, um, regret, and then, you know, fear the, the roller coaster of emotion that she shows throughout that final scene, um, ultimately culminating in like, kind of like this, um, depressed resignation of like, look, that never mind who we were, you know, we used to be homies. Uh, never mind that maybe there was a misunderstanding, even though she was like sticking to her guns and what, whatnot. At the end, she's like, look, I mean, Cole's on his way out. My son's a psychopath. Like, this shit's happening. And um, just the performance that she gave throughout the whole episode was incredible. Steve, what about you? I think I think Olivia Cook is a really good option. I'm actually going with Emma Darcy. I think they really crush that scene at the end between um, Alicent and Rhaenyra at the church. Um, the way Emma is able to sort of portray themselves as um, I'm really nervous about this interaction with my friend that we're at war with. And it, there's a little bit of a funny line where um, Rainier is like, oh, I've, I've handled this poorly, like that kind of thing. And then for Emma Darcy to really kind of you see the story of what's happening on their face as the as the scene sort of progresses, just this this. Uh, pain, feeling that Viserys didn't believe in Rhaenyra and revoked the right. Did he really change his mind? Did he really change his mind? And they play that so perfectly. And then when the Song of Ice and Fire comes up and you see just the realization, like, wait, wait a minute, this has all been a huge misunderstanding. I'm actually still the chosen one. I'm I'm the one that Viserys wanted the whole time. It's just brilliantly acted by Emma Darcy. They are just an incredible force in this scene. And they're really kind of, they've been very understated in their performances so far. Like it's been very subtle and subdued and not very big and huge, but it's always been great. And this scene has been just, it's its like, this should be on their reel for the rest of their life. If anyone's like, are they a good actor? <laughs> Look at this. This is yeah. phenomenal acting. I loved it. Uh, I'm never going to argue with an Emma Darcy nomination, but I do, I have to give it to Olivia Cook um, for all the reasons that Andy said. I mean, she just kind of dominates all of these different important interactions showcasing these different subtextual emotions. And it's just definitely done. Um, I think Olivia Cook's work is, is phenomenal in this episode. I also want to shout out my boy, Matt Smith, uh, for his work specifically in the Alice Rivers nightmare scene mm -hmm. uh, and seeing that regret and horror, you know, seeing him kind of um, unseated for the first time in a long time, you know, uh, totally unable to process what's going on and I'm a shit. Ah, you know, um, <laughs> oh. it, it, that was really neat, but yeah, I'm giving it to Olivia cook, which brings us finally to our Westeros inspection segment where we can talk about spoilers. So if you have not read fire, fire and blood in its entirety, uh, Get out. and watched all of game of Thrones, just flee for your own safety. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers ahead. The long, the night is long and, and full of spoilers. Mm -hmm. Ah, ah, all right. You've been warned. <laughs> you've been warned. <laughs> um, blue chew. Just kidding. It's one last little ad trick there. But yeah, seriously, spoilers. So I want to talk about some things. Uh, I'm sure you guys have some things as well. Um, namely, we never had this segment in this show. It's a segment from our Game of Thrones coverage. But so we weren't able to talk about like little elements of foreshadowing from past episodes. So I wanted to touch on those briefly, really quickly. There's a cool scene in the Blood and Cheese episode when, when Aemond returns to his apartments and he picks up that coin and he covers his other eye. Yeah, so it's the blue cool. sapphire or the eye patch and then the coin um, alluding to the fact that he gets stabbed through his other eye by Damon. Right. Mm -hmm. So some cool foreshadowing there. Also, in the scene between Bela and Jaceres, she's using a crossbow. And at one point, it frames 
her as an over the shoulder shot. And it looks like optically that she's pointing her crossbow at Jaceris, who, of course, famously dies from getting shot with a bunch of crossbows. Um, just cool little touches mm -hmm. like that that we haven't really been able to talk about. Um, and the Winter Wolves, we weren't able to discuss when Cregan Stark says that he would send 2,000 graybeards. <laughs> Yeah, pinching butts, pinching butts, butts pinches, all the way south from the north to the south <laughs> butts not be safe uh which isn't in the book but later on in fire and blood the first northmen to be sent are described as two thousand gray beards and they're nuts they're insane <laughs> people that are planning on dying and so they're unable to be defeated in battle because they're just so like fuck it you know um led by uh roderick i think roddy the ruin roddy, roddy the red sounds like a wwe wrestler hey, he's the one he gets his fucking shield rowdy arm. roddy the ruin <laughs> he gets a shield arm cut off and then still manages to cut down these two other dudes before he dies Christian so Gould, fucking i see you across the fish food <laughs> <laughs> and i want you to know yeah that roddy the ruin <laughs> is gonna go wild on you yeah <laughs> wrestlemania <laughs> <laughs> so at what point do they, the Winter Wolves, become the thing? Like, when do they come down? Because it's not till later, right? That they I, It's the battle of, it's a, they, turn, they turn the tide at fish feed? Yeah, because okay. they're the ones that like, they, they, they made it. They're like, we're charging first. We're going first because we're crazy motherfuckers. Mm. And they saw, suffer the most losses, I think, in that. They do, because yeah. they're always in the vanguard. Like, ah. Um, uh, they might have been in the battle before that. That's just the one I remember the most with them. And Cregan, Cregan does not no, show up with them. He's not in, in mm -hmm. with them. He shows up later. I also want to talk about the eggs because this is like a thing online. I never would have thought of if, if it wasn't a thing. Just want to see what you guys think and address. Some of the listeners are probably thinking about it because they also have access to the Internet. Um the shot of those four eggs, right? In the book, it is three eggs that Raina takes to the veil. And one of them hatches, and she does get a, a dragon named Morning. Um, but a lot of people online have noted that those eggs look exactly like the eggs that Daenerys Targaryen has. Uh, they're, one's green, one's black and red, uh, which might be a uh, Drogon. Um, and, and then a gold Like a goldish white one that might be... Regal. Yeah, Viserion, Regal, and Drogon. So that has been posited. Most book readers have always thought that um it was a uh, uh, Farman, right? Yeah. Took the three eggs and when she sold them for her ship in, in Essos, those must be the eggs that Daenerys has. And so some savvy people that have read the book and watched the shows have thought, well, maybe it's not canon, but maybe it's a show thing trying to connect Rhaenyra directly to Daenerys that Ryan Condal might suggest that those are the eggs. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> I think the eggs that Daenerys has are definitely Alyssa Farman's, and we could just leave it at that. But it, you know, I don't know. is that part of your head canon? No matter why what is there they do four in the show? instead of three, letting her get a dragon and also leave three. You know, it is right. interesting. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then there's the uh, the issue. Did you want to talk about the issue that we were giggling about that Andy was uh, confused on? Yeah. We so I got a comment on one of my um, recap videos for House of the Dragon that I do every Monday on TikTok with, hey, I think they're setting up Messaria to replace the character of Nettles. Oh, no. As a dragon writer, which I immediately said, I had your reaction. I said, that's ridiculous. Fuck no. And. She was probably a little offended. I didn't mean anything by that. I just had never occurred. You know, it was just a silly, right. such a silly thing to say. Um, and then I told Steve, because I had watched this episode in advance, hey, there's something that happens that I kind of got a, my butthole puckered. And because that scene with Masaria just kind of longingly staring at the dragon. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Rhaenyra like, hey, what's up? You know, just kind of I went, oh, no, because as a showrunner, there's an element of the Nettles storyline in the book that. Rainier is jealous of like a love connection there that doesn't actually exist, but it's enough to wheedle into her head because of other people getting in her head. Thinking right? that Nettles and Damon are a thing. Correct. Yes. Because they spend a lot of time together because they have two important dragons, Sheep Stealer and uh, Caraxes. So anyway, because there is a romantic history with Damon and Masaria, I thought, what if they just say she's from Esso, so she's got some Valyrian blood and all we'd have to do is a one-off line and all of a sudden you get Masaria out there on a dragon. 
That would know. be a terrible choice. Nettles is such a fan favorite character. Um, I, either way, I don't think Nettles is going to come out. I could see Condal getting rid of that character. Really? We, we got Alf and Hugh. We've got Adam. It's just a lot for book, you know, for casual watchers. But Alf and Hugh switch sides too, right? So they do. Um, having a um, dragon seed that is still on their side would be important for later seasons. Nettles doesn't actually do much that I recall. She goes with Damon to look for Amond and Vagar because together they could kill Vagar. And then because of Rhaenyra's actions, Damon sends Nettles away and fights Aemon by himself. And that's the reason he dies yeah. is because of, you know what I mean? And so ultimately, functionally, you don't need Nettles. You could just have Damon be like, I'm going to fight Aemon by myself and save a whole bunch of time. Now, it's cool that we don't know where Sheepstealer is and there's a living dragon somewhere on in Westeros mm -hmm. that no one ever sees again. But you don't need that. Yeah. Because that doesn't pop up in Game of Thrones, which takes place later. I just think, so I was talking to somebody who I won't out because they maybe aren't finished finishing their thoughts on this. That's what I was typing when you guys were talking a couple times. I text her and said, hey, have you watched the episode yet? And they said, yes. Like, what do you think about this theory that they might be replacing Masaria, Nettles with Masaria? And she was like, absolutely the fuck not. They're not doing that. I think Nettles will be Reyna. And I'm like, mm. why the fuck would they do that? Like, that makes no sense to me at all, right? But like, anyway, that's where we're at with this. I just want to throw it out there. Interesting, interesting. So I, I mean, they're definitely doing something with Masaria and the dragons. Well, Masaria in the book does become Rhaenyra's Lady of Whisperers. Yes. All that is tracking so far. Right. But there is a book where, there was a part in the book where Mushroom's like, Damon and uh, Masaria and Rhaenyra would sleep together all the time. Like, But Mushroom is always like, Crossing the line with, yeah, yeah, with, actually, yeah, he's with like, rumors, yeah. yeah. So, it, and because he would like the, the book says, but he also claimed that they would bring mushroom in from time to time, <laughs> 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 which is funny. Um, That's fire. So I don't know, man. I could kind of see. Not only did I start thinking they were doing that, but it kind of started working for me. You know what I mean? Because she's sorry, doing she's it? from the east, yeah. and like they could easily be like, yeah, she's a bastard of Valyrian lineage, blah 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 blah. But anyway. Um, that's all. I just want to throw that out there. They're doing something interesting with Nettles, perhaps, but maybe not. Maybe Nettles will show up in the next episode or so. Uh, Steve, I know the last thing that you want to talk about in Western Spection, or at least one of them. Oh, I was just going to touch upon, like, they mentioned Dragon Seed, but in the books, Dragon Seeds are a very specific. It's so in the show, I think Jace says it. He says Dragon Seed, but he's Ulf referring calls to people. himself. It's Ulf, Dragon Ulf, 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 yeah. Uh, he's just kind of say he kind of says it in a way where, like, oh, anybody who you know, is a Targaryen, is a dragon Related seed. to the Targaryens. But specifically yeah. dragon seeds in the book are like specifically people who are bastard children of uh, Targaryens or Valerians. Someone from Valyria, meaning not Valerian, but Valerians. Who go on to become dragon riders, right? Uh, well, dragon well, seed specifically people that become dragon riders? Or does it just well, mean They related? have that title, but I think the dragon seeds are specifically bastards. They're oh, not okay. just dragon riders, but they have the potential to be dragon riders because they're uh, bastard children. Um, there was one thing I wanted to discuss with you guys because we got a question and it is a very valid question. I wanted to see what you guys think about it. So obviously we're heading towards these dragon seeds. Uh, they've introduced Hugh the Hammer. They've int introduced Ulf the White. They introduced Adam of Hall um, and maybe Masaria. But the thing is, the show tells us that to be a dragon rider, you have to have Targaryen or Valyrian blood in you to be able to like command a dragon. And someone mentioned that like Adam of Hall is hinted to be the bastard child of Corlys Valarian. Mm -hmm. So how could he talk to a dragon? That we got a couple people uh, messaging us like, how could this bastard of Corlys Valarian, who isn't a dragon rider, be able to become a dragon rider? Because in the books, Adam of Hall goes on to ride Sea Smoke, the dragon that Lanor Valarian used to ride. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few things there. It is it's long been a question because it's just kind of glossed over in the book that he's Lanor's bastard, who is a dragon rider, but it's heavily implied he's actually Corliss's bastard because Lanor was gay. Um, I think you could easily explain it a, a couple of different ways. The Targaryens and the Valerians blood is, have intermingled many times throughout history because their houses are so close, even prior to them coming to uh, Westeros, right? Because Dragonstone is 
pretty close there. Um, so there's that. It could just be some Targaryen blood easily in Corlys, right? And he's never tried to ride a dragon. So mm -hmm. there's that. But also, they're also, they're, they are Valyrian, right? The Valarians are Valyrians. Mm -hmm. uh, now, historically not dragon riders, mm -hmm. but maybe again, that's a class issue. They never tried. They never had access to dragons back in Valyria, right? Perhaps. Because even the Targaryens were a lesser dragon riding house, as far as I understand. Yes. So there's two different ways right there. Like they just never tried before, right? So it's just that ability is in them. And I just, I think the bigger, most egregious kind of lore scare, if you're a super nerd, is that the show changed Lanor being killed to Lanor being alive. Uh, alive because he faked his death and was sent to Essos. And dragons can only have one rider. Right. So the bigger scare is how is Sea Smoke able to be ridden by anybody if Lanor is alive somewhere? And I was, I, I don't know what they're doing by well, saying Sea Smoke is lonely. restless. He's lonely. Lonely? Or are they implying that some some it, something befell he, Lanor in Essos and now he's dead and that's him freaking out about the psychic connection? You know what I mean? Maybe or, he knows he's alive and where where's daddy, you know? Yeah, so they're doing something there, and that might that might be, that might yeah. be all that the Masaria scene was for was to show that Sea Smoke was freaking out. You know what I mean? Oh, because that's why she was staring at Sea Smoke. Because is has died, or is just the I'll let someone else ride me because I'm so lonely. You know, I don't, yeah. know, I don't know what they're doing. I'm so lonely. They're doing some kind of lore band aid there for sure. So, but yeah, that's our answers to that. Okay. Uh, any other Westeros factions? No, that's it for me. This was a good one. Yeah. Mm. So that brings our coverage on House of the Dragon episode three to a close. You can join the conversation at streamingthingspod at gmail.com. You can get a bunch of different things like ad-free episodes, our entire uh, game of, ongoing Game of Thrones coverage, uh, extra bonus movie episodes, access to our Discord, all kinds of stuff by going to patreon.com slash streaming things. You can pick up our new uh, Big Red Newly Boy shirt that Andy's wearing right now. Hey. Yeah. To celebrate Hot D coming back. Rova Mele Newly Valencar, as they say in Valyrian. <laughs> I love it so much. Yeah, you can get access <laughs> to that as well. Regardless, thank you for, for listening to the show. Tune in next Monday for our House of the Dragon content. Uh, next Wednesday on Patreon, or this Wednesday, on Patreon for our Game of Thrones coverage. And uh, the boys every Friday for the nonce. Uh, that's all the time we have right now. We've got to go return some videotapes. My name is Kit. I'm Andy. And I'm Steve. And this was Streaming Things, streaming House of the Dragon. Happy streaming.